So, uh, yeah, so this is about the first 12 months of R at BCA. So I joined BCA about 18 months ago, um, and when I came here about six months ago, I was looking up with all these people presenting wild and wonderful R uh, scripts and graphics and visualizations, and I thought, in 12 months' time, I want to be doing that. And so this is that, the story of that 12 months uh, at BCA, what we've been through, the different steps, and hopefully this will be of use to other people as you, you, know, you start your journey now or if you're you know, uh, perhaps slightly behind us, you know, hopefully you'll see some things in here that are useful to you. Um, so uh, what I'd like to talk about then is, uh, is on this page here. Um, I'll start just by introducing myself. Doug's already done a nice job on a couple of those points. Uh, I'll just expand a little bit on that and why I joined BCA. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about engaging senior leaders in the organisation and what worked for me. Uh, and then about once you've done that and once you've got the sign off and you've got the capital approved, um, how you then integrate R into a broader business intelligence strategy. So for me, R isn't just a standalone piece. It's, it's a piece of a, a kind of overall strategy that involves multiple tools and, and different parts of the business. Um, I'd like to talk about making the right technology choices from the start. So once you've agreed to use R and you've seen how it fits into the organisation, make sure that you make the right decisions as you're going through that setup phase. Um, and then it was quite important for us to, to move quickly, and so selecting the right partner for our business was a key step. Um, and then uh, once, once we've selected a partner, we started building things, we need to make sure that it flows into the business. So setting up that sort of, uh, network of data champions was really, really important as well. So I'll talk about what we did there. And then finally, once everything's working, you know, how do we capture the benefits and, and how do we describe those? So a little bit about me. So as Doug said, my previous employers were Diamond and PwC. Diamond were quite a specialist uh, IT and data strategy consulting firm. They were bought by PwC in uh, 2011, I believe, um, and uh, to, in order to expand PwC's kind of capabilities around data strategy and analytics. Um, I left PwC uh, just uh, under two years ago now. Um, I thought after 13 years as a consultant, telling what other people how to implement data analytics, I should try out some of the ideas myself and see if they work. Um, so I've been doing that for the last two years. Uh, outside work, I uh, have a, a DJI drone, which I quite like flying. Uh, and this was a picture from a recent holiday. Uh, and also, I'm quite a cyclist as well, so I like photography and cycling. Uh, about BCA then. So uh, BCA are the largest vehicle remarketing organization in the UK. Um, a lot of people uh, will be aware of fleet and lease arrangements that uh, you might have with your company cars. Typically, at the end of that three years, the leasing car company wants to dispose of the vehicle, um, and that would be uh, a good source of vehicles for us. Equally, when you part exchange your BMW in a Porsche dealership, should you be so lucky, um, you, uh, the Porsche dealership was no interest in the BMW, so they would then offload the car through us as well. So we're a, typically a business-to-business -business car uh, marketing uh, uh, company. We also do a lot of logistics work um, as well around that. And a number of you are probably aware of those very irritating uh, uh, jingles from We Buy Any Car. Uh, that's another part of our business as well, the vehicle purchasing division. So um, why did I join BCA then? Uh, so three quick images on that. Uh, the first reason was... Um, I like to ski in fresh snow, and that's an analogy I apply to data science as well. I think uh, the more interesting uh, data science roles involve data when no one else has uh, sort of explored it before. And so I wanted to join a company where there hadn't been anyone using R before I got there. There hadn't been anyone using SAS. It was all virgin fresh snow. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, also, I wanted a place that had valuable data. I didn't want all this analysis that I was doing to, to fall on deaf ears. I wanted people to find it, find it useful. The five years of data we have in our data warehouse of all the transactions uh, is, if you add up all the hammer prices or the prices that the vehicles went for at auction, it adds up to about the GDP of Paraguay. So there's kind of a lot of valuable, uh, valuable data in there. 
Um, and of course, if you're selling a car for £5,000, any small incremental improvement in performance can make a very significant difference to the bottom line. And then finally, um, I don't know how many other people watched uh, Knight Rider when they were children. Um, I was brought up on a, uh, a set of uh, children's programs which involved Knight Rider, um, General Lee, in, uh, and uh, the Batmobile. And so pretty much all my childhood was spent watching cars, and so I wanted to work in a, in a car industry as well. So, um, uh, now to get on to the uh, more serious stuff. Uh, talking to senior leadership leaders in the organisation, I think there's four sort of really uh, important arguments that can be used uh, when uh, selling, selling R within the organisation. Um, I used all, all four of these. Uh, depending on the person I was talking to, I would tend to overplay one, one or others um, in case you can't work them out. Obviously, the first one is, there's gold in them, they're hills. And this was an expression that was said to me on my first day, is, uh, Ben, we know there's a lot of value in our data, but we don't know where it is. You know, please, can you help us find it? And so I think it, you know, one of the reasons for adopting R was very much uh, an understanding there was some data there, some value in the data, but no one really knew what it was. The sheep argument is obviously, the, I think it's been touched on recently in the last talks, uh, you know, other, other people are t adopting R and it's becoming a more of kind of mainstream. That tended to work with, uh, with some of the senior execs as well. The, the free point, obviously it's not entirely free, but it's, it's a hell of a lot cheaper to start up an R project than it is a SaaS project. And then finally the university point as well, you know, a lot of new graduates coming, uh, coming in and a lot of them being fluent in R. So uh, those are the, the kind of four key reasons. I think the one actually at BCA it says something about the organisation is the sheep argument was probably the most, uh, the, most uh, the, the easiest, easiest one anyway. So um, once you've engaged everyone, and so that was a process probably that took about six months when I first joined, was to say, you know, we need to change. What, what we're doing at the moment isn't sustainable and, and things need to move forward. Uh, once you've done that, then I think it's really important to articulate how R fits into a broader business intelligence strategy. And the way I did that was, was using this slide. Um, and this, when I presented this slide to the um, CIO, this was the point at which he kind of got what I was, what I was saying. And um, what I was saying was we needed to invest in a data warehouse because that's our single version of truth. That's where all the data comes from. And we need to clean the data in that data warehouse. We don't want to have cleaning happening in each of the different tools. Uh, we'd already invested, uh, or the, the CIO in question had already invested a lot of money in business objects. So I wanted to uh, reassure him that we weren't going to throw that away at any time soon. Um, and that's really useful, actually, when you want to do standard kind of statement-like reporting which we do a lot for our vendors. Um, we also uh, built an Excel um, an analysis services cube that people can just use and consume in Excel, um, which a lot of people find very useful. It's a lot more user-friendly and easier for people to, to get into quickly than, than R is. Um, we use, or we've just started using ClickView more extensively, uh, which allows that kind of data exploration and that sort of um, drill down and then finally R for the advanced analytics and visualization and w one of the things that really helped people understand this page was when I described kind of those use cases for each of the different tools and I said you know so this is the sort of example for what we would use business objects for this is the sort of example we'd use a cube for and it was very clear to people the distinction between the different tools I'm not a believer in making a tool will do something just for the sake of it. You know, I, I'm not interested in making R do other things that it's not really, you know, designed or sort of well developed to do. Whereas, you know, there's other tools that are off the shelf that, that do that more effectively. So uh, once you've built that strategy and you've got a kind of coherent story on, on what you want to do, um, I think it's really important when you're looking at R to make the right sort of technology choices. When we were starting out, um, I think our IT team very much kind of Microsoft um, savvy, you know, and they really you know, understand how the Microsoft stack fits together. And so I think a natural sort of choice for them would have just been to build me a Microsoft uh, Windows server and say, there you go, Ben, pull your boots, you know, go right ahead. We can easily maintain that. 
Um, and uh, I, I, rather than just accepting that, um, we, we put together a, a really, it, it, was, it kind of went down as one of the most important meetings, I suppose. We had an expert session where we had people from outside come in to help us sort of understand the different pros and cons of different technical choices. And it was through that session that we said, okay, yeah, there are some IT benefits from uh, maintaining a single sort of software vendor in Microsoft, but equally, there are also some quite significant benefits in terms of being able to use our Studio server if you run uh, Linux versus that's not available on Windows. And so uh, what we ended up using was CentOS um, because there was one guy in the IT team conveniently who had some familiarity with that. Um, and to keep, to keep IT happy, we actually ended up using Microsoft TFS, Team Foundation Server, as our source code system, because uh, that has a Git uh, connection. So from our studio, uh, we've got the full version control stuff built in using our studio. It just connects seamless, pretty much seamlessly uh, to TFS server. So all the source code and everything else is kept in the same IT sort of uh, control backed up and everything else. Um, but we get to use our studio server and all the kind of benefits that goes along with that. So. Um, once we'd made those decisions, um, it was then important to us to, to choose the right partner to, to help us along that journey. And um, there were two real key aspects that we wanted to include into that decision. Um, and this goes back to before I, I started, BCA had commissioned a, a, another um, sort of consulting company uh, to do some work with us. And uh, the, the, one of the things I found when I started working at BCA was that there were some issues with some of the work that they'd done that no one else had picked up um, because you know no one else in the organisation was kind of savvy to that level of, of detail. And um, so there was a lot of sort of mistrust, I suppose, or concern that if we were going to go and uh, select another partner, uh, that they would do the same thing effectively. And we needed to know that whoever we brought on was going to have the sort of technical capabilities. I think if you're doing a vendor selection exercise, it's very easy to do the kind of can they work with us piece because actually that's, um, that's a relatively straightforward, you can meet them, you can see how you get on with them, you can have a chat, you know, you might, after the pitch, you might, you know, go and get a coffee with them or whatever, and you can kind of understand if you can work with them. I think assessing uh, a, a, an external advisor's technical capabilities during that sort of process is actually relatively difficult. And so the way we went about it was um, we said, well, you know, we're judging, we, we want them to do work for us in, in R, uh, why don't we get them to do a sort of mini exercise? And so we had three vendors, uh, we gave them all the same uh, training set of data, um, and we said, you know, go and build a model um, on this data, and whoever has the most accurate model kind of wins this, that component of the selection. Um, it was incredibly useful because it uh, really drew some clear water in between the different vendors we were talking to. Uh, the first vendor completely failed to, to get a, a model back. Uh, the second one brought one, back one with some significant errors in, and the one we ended up going with actually you know, was, was easier than most, most accurate. Um, and I, th I found it incredibly uh, useful to have that kind of quantitative piece alongside the qualitative piece because it, it, I think when you're doing a selection like this, it's very easy for the senior people into the organisation to go, let's have the cheapest. You know, why spend extra money on these guys when you know, these guys can do effectively the same product? And if you've got a kind of quantitative analysis that says, actually, well, you know, we gave the guys the same data, these guys were 2%, 3%, whatever it is, more accurate. Um, you know, if you translate that into car values, 2 or 3% on a £5,000 car, it's quite a significant difference in value. So I think it's, it's really useful to have that kind of qualitative piece, and I'd certainly look, look for that uh, if I was ever going to do this again. So um, once you've, you've got this uh, partner involved, and they've you know, helped you build, um, build some great uh, models, uh, clearly the next step is to, to get that into the business. 
And so this was another slide that I put together which helped people understand how the different teams work together. So uh, the data champions are effectively um, uh, doing their day job. You know, they, they don't, they're not new recruits. They're just people who are doing analysis anyway in the business. Um, and uh, so we said, okay, great, you guys carry on doing that, but also join this call every two weeks and we'll tell you about all the stuff that we're doing. Uh, the core BI team uh, are effectively full-time resources working on the, the BI strategy and we've got an offshore team in Romania who are doing a lot of the data warehouse work. Uh, we've got our, our data scientists who work in our main head office um, and then our reporting team who work up near Birmingham. And they're all sort of managed and their efforts are aligned through a kind of single roadmap uh, which is managed by the delivery manager. And this setup works really well for us because it is really scalable. Um, because if we want to do more data warehouse development work, we just get another guy in Romania. Um, if we want to start doing more models, we just get more data scientists. And if, if we want to bring in other areas of business, we just bring in other data champions. So I think it's, it's worked very well for us. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, once, once you've built all these uh, great models and they're being used by the business, uh, a really key and important stage is, is capturing the benefits. <laughs> Um, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld, wasn't it, who came up with the unknown un unknowns expression. Things that you benefits, in our case, benefits that are out there that you just have no idea are out there. And so for me, this is characterized by these two pictures. Um, we've got the presence that you have no idea what's inside them. They're just sort of boxes. And other presence that you've got a pretty good idea what that's going to be before you open it, I guess. So um, some of our benefits were very much uh, in, in both of these two camps. We knew we were going to be able to predict vehicle values more accurately. We knew we were going to be able to demonstrate benefits from some of the value-added services that we offer. Um, but you know, we, we didn't know, for example, that by using the circularized package, which I've found really useful, uh, we can show the relationship between buyers and vendors. And as an exchange, that's really useful for us. No one would be able to visualize the interconnectedness in our, of our marketplace between buyers and vendors uh, until we kind of started to delve into the, the circularized package and being able to use that to link them up. And so that was a complete unknown, unknown benefit. So um, one of the things that I often got when I started uh, 18 months ago is, Ben, we want to be able to do this, we want to be able to do that. And typically what I found was that those benefits were probably quite a long way down the line, two or three years potentially in, in some cases. And so I built up this slide and obviously on the real side there's real things in there rather than benefits one, two and three. Um, and to describe that actually it's not just something that you can't just uh, start swimming at the deep end or you know go down a black run on your first day. You want to sort of build incrementally. Um, and I think that's particularly true with, with our models and, and the work we've done is that each model kind of incrementally builds on on, uh, on the previous one. Um, and one of the things that obviously was key for us is to sort of start, start monetizing some of these benefits as well. And we found actually the, some of the first immediate benefits were things that would uh, more sort of help the performance of the team, productivity of the team, and some of the longer ones were things where we'd actually be able to sort of sell and, and get them out there for people to use. So um, that's, in a nutshell, really, surprising how quickly it goes when you describe it like that, uh, the last 12 months of our BCA and, and where we've, we've come from and, and our direction of travel. Um, I think uh, you know, it's, um, it's been an incredibly interesting and enjoyable experience for me because I've learned a hell of a lot of new stuff. Um, and I think um, you know, what I just described uh, outside, one of the things we've we started on now is more of a kind of a, a TikTok type uh, way of working with our partner where you know a partner will kind of come in help us build something we'll kind of get it working and sort of play around with it tweak it over time uh, and then kind of get them back to help us build the next next piece and that's the sort of rhythm that we've started on now where we sort of build something get it working build the next thing get that working okay Thank you.